I thank you for representing my original hometown in the United States House of Representatives and doing it so well. I might add, and I, Wes, you can correct me, I am sure he is the only gerontologist in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, good to be here with you, and I started writing down names of all the distinguished personages here, but you will forgive me if I, I, I quickly uh, uh, stop that procedure, but your state chairman, Wayne Anderson, as well as uh, Charlie Porter, former House member, and Jim Weaver, with whom I served in, in the House, Secretary of State Bill Kiesling, and Commissioner Mary Roberts, Nancy, uh, who uh, she would have no reason to remember, but uh, uh, we, uh, we moved outside the city limits. Back, I don't know what year it was, but I was in the fourth grade. And uh, 26th Street was outside the city limits at that point. And we were then in a rural school district, the Dunn School District. And uh, the Morses lived in that school district. Good to be with uh, some longtime friends uh, who probably will be embarrassed by my acknowledging it, but I went to high school with Don Schmidi and Bob Moffat. Uh, they are here with their wives. It's good to have you here. And Ed Sullivan, another longtime friend. I don't know, I, I, I know he's here somewhere with Dorothy, his wife. It is great to be, to have you here. And Wes Coin, I did start in the house with Les. This afternoon I met with the editorial board of the Eugene Register Guard and uh, they asked about the Senate race here. And I said, if Les Coin is elected to the United States Senate, he very quickly will become a star in the United States Senate. And I said, not a star in the to start the applause there. <laughs> I said, not a star in the sense that he's going to be out just trying to get all the publicity uh, that he can get, but a star in the sense of really doing the substantial work that needs to be done in the United States Senate for this state and for this nation and for our world. And I'm uh, very proud to have Les Coin as a colleague in the United States. State's House of Representatives, and I would love to see Les Coin in the United States Senate. I knew Wayne Morse slightly. Uh, he, as I mentioned, he, we were in the same uh, school district. Uh, my brother was in the same grade school class with Nancy. Uh, I, back in those days, and we may very well have violated the child labor laws, as I recall, but we would go, we'd pick string beans, and then we, you know, we went from crop to crop when you, during the summertime. And I remember picking cherries on the, on the Morris Farm. I remember being in high school, going up to Oregon City to hear the debate between Senator Holman and Wayne Morris, a very significant debate early in that uh, endeavor to become a member of the United States Senate. I have seen, as I told Nancy before, I see, I uh, have seen up until recently, uh, uh, her mother, Mildred, uh, the widow of the senator, occasionally in Washington. And of course, I remember all the fights that he made. Uh, I had a chance to, when I was Lieutenant Governor of Illinois to occasionally be on a platform with Wayne Morris. But the one that I shall never forget, where he and Senator Greening of Alaska stood up like a rock of Gibraltar was on the Tonkin Bay Resolution. <laughs> Few more Wayne Morses or Ernest Greenings 
57,000 American lives might have been saved, and who knows how many hundreds of thousands, and perhaps some people even say over a million Vietnamese lives would have been saved. Wes said what we need is people with a sense of purpose. I agree. And if there was one thing that Wayne Morris had in abundance, it was Mr. President, and Anne, I didn't even acknowledge Lucinda, I didn't acknowledge all you people over here. Wayne Morris had that sense of purpose. Where are the Wayne Morses today? The Wayne Morses should not just be people in public office. The Wayne Morses, to really be effective, have to have support from people who are high school teachers or labor leaders or whatever your background may be. Uh, we need, and I was pleased to meet today with the president of the University of Oregon and hear him say that he was for the Simon Durnberger Amendment in the United States Senate. We have a choice in reauthorizing the Higher Education Act, whether we are going to spend $1 billion to $1.4 billion subsidizing banks and lending institutions or subsidizing students. And I don't think we should have a hard time making a decision on that. And yet we have very few, at this point, very few university leaders who are standing up. And I'm pleased to say the president of the University of Oregon is one of those few who, at this point, is willing to stand up and say this money ought to go to students and not to subsidize lending institutions. It is interesting that when the religious community has moved together on something like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it may move ponderously slowly, but there eventually is action. It is very difficult for me to imagine the ancient prophet Amos not standing up and saying, you know, you're not doing things right today. It becomes very easy to accommodate. And Peter, I will make one minor correction in that generous introduction that you made. Uh, and that is my father, unfortunately, didn't own a radio station. Uh, I wish he had owned a radio station. But he was, uh, he was a pastor of Grace Lutheran Church, which at that time was at 11th and Ferry Street here in Eugene. Some of you may remember the church when it existed, had a high steeple on it. But uh, I remember uh, he, uh, in those days, you could walk across a field over to KORE on Willamette Street. And he uh, said when they took 120,000 Japanese Americans away from the West Coast, told them in 24 to 48 hours, you have to sell everything you own, put it all in a suitcase. And my father said, this is not right to treat uh, American citizens this way. And I would love to tell you, and this you didn't mention in your introduction, I'd love to tell you, I was 13 then, I would love to tell you I stood up for my father I had, and you have to understand the, the emotional fervor of the time. I was embarrassed. I wish my father hadn't done it. But as I look back, it's one of the things I'm proudest of my father for. And I wonder where were, where were the religious leaders who should have stood up? Where were the leaders of the bar who should have stood up? Where were the journalists? who should have stood up for the rights of fellow Americans. It becomes so easy to accommodate. I mean, just cite Catholic. It was a country that was about half Lutheran and half Roman Catholic. 
where the religious leaders largely were silent. They accommodated. Oh, there, were, there was a Dietrich body for here and someone else there, but very few. Listen to what a uh, Christian theologian, Emmanuel Hirsch, wrote. No other people in the world has a leading statesman such as ours who takes Christianity so seriously. On May 1st, when Adolf Hitler closed his great speech with a prayer, the whole world could sense the wonderful sincerity in that. Or, in 1934, the Baptists held their Fifth World Congress in Berlin. After that meeting, one U.S. Baptist leader wrote, Chancellor Adolf Hitler gives the prestige of his personal example, since he neither uses intoxicants nor smokes. And the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville cautioned, uh, and I'm quoting, against too hasty judgment of a leader who had stopped German women from smoking cigarettes and using red lipstick in public. We accommodate too easily. And we need religious leaders who today are not going to walk by on the other side who are going to reach out for those less fortunate. We are, as a people, more segregated on the basis of economics than at any point in our nation's history. Unless you live in a very small town, the odds are all your neighbors are in roughly the same economic category that you are. And so it becomes easier and easier in our society to ignore the problems of the less fortunate. One-fifth of the children in this nation today live in homes below the poverty level. If you take homes where the income is half the poverty level, in the last 10 years there are an additional 1.6 million children in those homes. What kind of a society are we building? I want leaders who are going to stand up, religious leaders who are going to stand up to that kind of thing. We talk, we hear talk about a thousand points of light. And I am all for a thousand points of light, but there are no batteries for that <laughs> thousand points of light. spotlighting on the needs of those in our society who are so desperate. We're not doing it as we should. And when I say all of these things to my friend from Krakow, we're pleased to have you here. We have deficiencies in our system, just as you do. You have to strive to move ahead, and we're excited by what you're doing just as we have to move ahead. But the religious community has to stand up as it is not standing up right now. And the media has to do a better job. My uh, mentor in politics was a great United States Senator who served with Wayne Moore, Paul Douglas. I was in the state legislature, Mr. Speaker, you can appreciate this, I was in the state legislature when Paul Douglas called me one day and said, will you introduce a resolution calling on me to introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to make the corn tassel the national flower? Because I had such great respect for Paul Douglas, I said yes. And then I thought about it all day, and I thought, I don't want to introduce a resolution on the corn tassel. <laughs> I called him that night and I said, Paul, are you sure you want me to introduce a resolution on the court tassel? And you're, are you sure you want to do it? And he became Professor Douglas again. And he said, Paul, remember this. The substantial things you do in political life will receive very little attention. The trivial is what receives attention. You introduce your resolution. 
I'll introduce it in the United States Senate. It will be in every newspaper in Illinois. <laughs> it will not pass. <laughs> but no one will be angry with us. <laughs> so you will have done something that is essential to survive in politics. Well, I learned something about journalism and about politics. <laughs> I am concerned that the media isn't prodding our conscience. I mentioned the Japanese-American problem before. Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't remember any editorials standing up for the rights of Japanese Americans. Even the American Civil Liberties Union didn't stand up. The state of Washington, I would love to tell you the state of Oregon Civil Liberties Union did, but the state of Washington Civil, Civil Liberties Union did. But the attention to things that aren't important and the inattention to things that are important if you have a very good memory, you may remember that four years ago, I was a candidate for president. <laughs> and, <laughs> one of the great newspapers of this country, the New York Times, wrote to each of us in that race and said, will you give your medical history for life we want your academic records from high school on, who your friends were in high school and college, your financial records, that I don't argue because that can reflect on whether you're serving the public or not. But I received no letter from the New York Times asking me, where do you stand on urban education? Where do you stand on health care for this nation? Where do you stand on the problem of the deficit? Something's out of balance. And in this presidential year, I would love to see the Register Guard and the Oregonian send, as well as other great newspapers in this nation, Send a series of maybe five questions, ten questions, to every presidential candidate, including the incumbent president, and ask specific questions about what the policy is going to be, and then say, we're going to print your answers, and we're going to evaluate those answers. I think we need that. The Washington Post, this last presidential election, had an editorial saying, we're not going to endorse either Bush or Dukakis because we don't like what either one is saying. They're not addressing the issues. What the Washington Post might have added is one of the reasons that the issues have not been addressed is that we didn't do our job. The media has to do a much better job. And then those of us in politics have to do a better job. And Lessa Coyne made a very key point when he said we have to have politicians who are not compelled to absolutely win. I want to win. But let me tell you, I want Lessa Coyne to be willing to take some stands that are not popular stands. I think it's essential. And let me add, if I may be immodest here, Last year, I had an opponent who was spent more than any challenger to an incumbent in the nation, who had uh, President Bush come in for four times, who was on the popular side of every issue. And I got, had people in Illinois and my staff and in my party unhappy with me for the stands I was taking, and I assume there are going to be some people in this hall who are going to be unhappy with Les O'Coin if he does the kind of a job campaigning that I'm confident he will. But uh, she took a stand saying there should be no tax increases. I said we have to face some revenue increase needs. She took a stand in uh, support of the 
capital punishment. 85% of the people in Illinois favor capital punishment. I took a stand in opposition. But in the debate, in debate, for example, when she raised the capital punishment issue, I said, I don't happen to favor it because it's a punishment we reserve for people of modest means. If you can afford the best attorneys, you don't get capital punishment. But I said, if you want a candidate who's going to be doing the popular thing, by all means, vote for my opponent. But of course, then you could vote for anyone walking down the street. If you want leadership that's going to come and tell you some things you may not like to hear, then vote for Paul Simon. And I, and I ended up winning by the biggest plurality of any candidate for governor or senator of either plur uh, political party in the nation. And it told me that you can stand up for things that may not be popular and still win. I remember the man who walked up to me when I was in Chicago one day and he said, I think I disagree with you on every issue, but I trust you and I'm going to vote for you. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we have to have candidates who are willing to tell people the truth, not hold their finger to the wind and say, what do the latest political polls have to say? And uh, the nation is going to be well served when we do that. Well, finally, what are the causes that a Wayne Morse might fight for today? There are any number of causes that we might mention. I think he'd be for campaign finance reform. I think he would be very much opposed to, and he'd be fighting the Rust versus Sullivan decision of the United States Supreme Court that is a basic threat to freedom of speech. It's not an abortion. It is a, in, indirectly an abortion case. But when the United States Senate says that when the federal government finances something, it can control what is said, that is a fundamental attack on freedom of speech. If because of the Library Services and Construction Act we support libraries, can we then say what books are going to be in libraries? Because we have some funding of the University of Oregon, can we say what courses are going to be taught there? Well, I think he'd be fighting on those. But let me mention just three other things briefly. One is excessive use of the military. We have we have become enamored with things that are saber-rattling things. Uh, I'm proud of our armed forces, proud of the job they did in the Middle East, but uh, we move too quickly into situations we should not move into and then brag what we have done. Grenada. Grenada has a population of Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> to brag that we successfully invaded Rockford, Illinois, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense at all. It, it's like the Los Angeles Rams beating Eugene High School South. You, you, you can hardly expect them to do anything else. And in the Iraq-Kuwait situation, um, we had to stay, stand up to aggressors. But uh, I can remember when George Mitchell and several of us went over to the uh, Middle East a few weeks before the use of force was, was authorized and we met with the president when we came back. And in the final pitch to us, he said, well, if we use force, we can make the United Nations meaningful. And I said, Mr. President, can, we, can I have a 30-second response? And uh, he said, of course. I said, if Libya invades Chad, you're not going to send 400,000 troops. 
if Mozambique invades Malawi, you're not going to send 400,000 troops. You would be willing to impose economic sanctions. If we can make economic sanctions do the trick, we will have really done something for peace and stability in this world. And arguments, Les can remember this, Peter you can remember this, if we authorize, if we don't authorize the use of force, Saddam Hussein will stay in power in Iraq. <laughs> and I don't need to tell you what has happened, and to this day, the Prime Minister of the Great Britain has come out for democracy in Iraq. The President of France has come out for democracy in Iraq, and the President of the United States has yet to say we ought to have a democracy in Iraq. And when the State Department personnel whisper to you, well, you can't expect this in an Arab country, that's a put down. I'm a strong supporter of Israel, but let me tell you, I, I also chair the subcommittee on Africa. And I remember when they said the same thing about African countries, you can't expect democracy, and yet democracy is spreading across Africa, just as certain as I'm standing in front of you, and it can happen to Arab countries too. We have to take a look at our priorities. $295 billion military budget today. If you put it in 1991 dollars, and you take out Korea and Vietnam, in the height of the Cold War, we spent $235 billion on our military budget. What kind of sense does this make? Two weeks ago, the Pentagon issued this press release saying by the end of 1995, we're going to have 50% of our troops out of Western Europe. Why wait till the end of 1995? <laughs> and what it does to distort everything. In the last 31 years, we have spent as much on military research as we have spent on medical research since the beginning of the century. we have the right priorities? I think Wayne Morris would be telling us we need different priorities. The second thing I think Wayne Morris would be fighting is this inward movement in the United States. Inward movement, first of all, international. That we look at our own problems and ignore the rest of the world. Now, I am for looking at our problems. But I don't think we can ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. We'll, we spend $2 trillion to make sure the Soviet Union isn't a military threat. And when Sam Nunn and Les Aspen want to spend $1 billion to dismantle Soviet weapons, we can't get the votes to do it, and we end up with 500 million. Uh, stability in that area of the world, stability in Poland, and Czechoslovakia is important to us. After World War II, we spent 2.9% of our gross national product on the Marshall Plan to help the poor beyond our borders. Today, we are spending one-fifth of 1% of our GNP, helping the poor beyond our borders, and our average income in real terms is two and a half times as much as it was at the time of the Marshall Plan. What's the difference? Well, the difference is this. After World War II, the Schmitz could come to their senators and their House members and say, what are you doing to help my relatives in Germany. The Zaganellis came and said, what are you doing to help my relatives in Italy? Now the people who need help live in places like Bangladesh, in 
no one comes up to me and says, what are you doing to help my relatives in Bangladesh? And so we ignore the rest of the world. But we do it ultimately at our own peril. Majority of people alive in the face of the earth this minute are going to die before their natural time, either for lack of food or for lack of protein in their food. While ironically, some of us in this hall tonight will die before our natural time because we have too much good food. The World Health Organization says for $300 million, less than the cost of one half of a B-2 bomber, we could eliminate most of the childhood diseases that are life-threatening today around the face of the earth. And yet we can't come up with $300 million. Those of you who are my age or older remember when whooping cough was here everywhere in the United States. What we don't remember is that 10,000 to 30,000 children die each year in this country of whooping cough. And now it has virtually disappeared. And yet you look at developing nations and nation after nation, whooping cough is one of the major causes of death in these countries. Let me tell you, I, I have more notes than I have time, but let me, let me tell you about one visit I made about three years ago to Malawi, a country in the southern part of Africa. Malawi's right next to Mozambique. Mozambique has had a civil war. Malawi's one of the poorest nations in the world. 28 of the 42 poorest nations in the world are in Africa. Malawi, 7 million people. 750,000 refugees from the Mozambique Civil War. It would be like the United States having 30 million refugees. I went down to a refugee camp in the southern part of, the, of Malawi, 40,000 people in the camp. They asked me to speak to the refugees there. And I wish I could describe the scene to you accurately. They divided it into three groups, men, women, and children. And they sat on the ground. And there, there are thousands of people here. No PA system, very primitive. I would shout, an interpreter would shout after me. But when I spoke to the children, about 20 feet from me was a little boy, 10 or 11 years old, with an infected eye and insects on his eye. And I said, is anyone going to help him? And the response was, we can only take care of emergencies. I've never forgotten that. I get choked up when I think about it. I've never forgotten that little boy. I don't know how that little boy's future ties in with the future of my children and that one grandchild that we have, but I know that it does. And I know we have to do better. Uh, of it, but uh, one of the results of this sanctification of indifference that has taken place in the last 10 years, this appeal to the greed in us rather than the noble in us, and leaders can do either one, but this has caused all kinds of problems and we're going to be reaping the harvest for that for a long time to come. The great disservice of the Reagan-Bush years is not the two and a half trillion they added to the national debt. It is they're telling us you don't need to take care of one another. You don't need to pull together. Indifference is just a small step to Willie Hortonism, which is just a small step to David Dukeism. We have created this thing that is in our midst today, and we have to turn it around. And uh, I hope, I hope you can help. Unless I want you to be a leader in helping to turn that around. Lamar Alexander called me yesterday morning to tell me about 
the new uh, directive they have given that says specifically setting aside scholarships for minorities is illegal. My friends, it's part of the same whole thing. We have, in the state of Oregon, you have scholarships for the University of Oregon that are set aside by community, and many of the communities are all white. The state of Florida has scholarships for the descendants of Confederate war veterans. There are not very many black Confederate war veterans. <laughs> Uh, we have to be a people that stands for opportunity for everyone, and we're moving away from that. Well, finally, one other area, and that is fiscal problems, and Peter, you referred to this. One of the things that is happening in our society, and I will not bombard you with statistics, but a few are important. One of the things is that interest is crowding out our ability to respond on a lot of other things because both political parties have not faced up to our fiscal problems. 1949, we spent 9% of our federal budget on education. Today, we're spending 3% of our federal budget on education. Uh, and let me just commend an earlier recipient of this award, uh, Lowell White in Connecticut, who had shown great courage as governor of Connecticut. They had a rally, and I understand Connecticut has roughly the same population as uh, Oregon. He faced up to the fiscal problems. They just had a rally. 40,000 people showed up to protest the imposition of an income tax in the state of uh, Connecticut. Uh, I don't know the details of everything there, but I know Lowell Weicker is a gutsy person. We are playing games, fiscal games, and I believe Wayne Morris would tell us stop playing games and face reality. When we list interest now, it used to be gross interest. It is now net interest. What's the difference? Well, we subtract the interest earned by the Social Security trust funds and the other trust funds before we list it so it doesn't look so bad. The real figure is gross interest. Fiscal year 1980, $74 billion in interest. This last fiscal year, $286 billion in interest. This fiscal year, the estimate is $310 billion in interest. For the first time in the nation's history, interest will be the number one expenditure of the United States government passing defense. I don't care whether you're a conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, to spend a higher and higher percentage of our tax dollar on interest rather than goods and services just does not make sense. And there is a massive redistribution of wealth that takes place. Who pays the $310 billion? It is working men and women, people of limited income by and large. Who collects it? People who are more fortunate and increasingly people who are more fortunate beyond our borders. I asked the Congressional Budget Office and the Congressional Research Service what the relationship is between the budget deficit and the trade deficit. And they said studies show 37 to 55 percent of the trade deficit is caused by the budget deficit. That's thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs here in the state of Oregon. What do we do about it? I think this is one of those areas where traditionally Democrats have opposed a constitutional amendment saying, unless there's a 60% vote of Congress to the contrary, uh, you have to have a balanced budget. But it is interesting that now we have economists like Lester Thoreau coming aboard saying we have to move in this direction. Fred Burks, Barry Bluestone, bright young economists who say this interest monster is just eating us up. What happens long term if we don't do anything about it? Right now we're heavily dependent on Social Security retirement funds to buy our bonds. 
Starting in the year 2003, there will be a, there'll be a sizable increment in people retiring. Starting in the year 2010, a very substantial increment. At that point, Congress and the President will have three choices to make. One, you can dramatically cut back on Social Security payments. And you can guess how politically popular that would be. Number two, we can dramatically increase taxes. And you can guess how politically popular that would be. And the third option, you can print more money. That is the politically easy way out, and it is the most disastrous by far of the three. And yet that's the direction we're headed if we don't get a hold of these, this thing. Well, you may agree or disagree that these are things Wayne Morris would have been fighting for. I think he would. Let me close by telling you a story about someone who served with Wayne Morris, who was a distinguished Republican member of the United States Senate, Jacob Javits, from New York. He was defeated in the Republican primary. Shortly after he was defeated, it was discovered he had Lou Gehrig's disease. And you could just see Jack Javits shrinking in front of him. About eight weeks before he died, he was wheeled into my office, wearing a device on his chest. Bob Moffat would know what I'm talking about. A device on his chest to keep him breathing. And they plugged it into the wall so he could keep breathing. And he started lobbying me on a bill he was interested in. And when he finished lobbying me, I turned to him and I said, Jack, you're an inspiration. And I'll never forget his response. He said, Paul, you have to have a mission in life. I agree. Wayne Morris was someone who had a mission in life. He wanted to fight for the civil liberties of this country. He wanted to see that we could make opportunity there for every American. That's a mission that's worth fighting for. And I hope you and I will continue that fight. Thank you very much. Senator Wayne Morris to our nation's history and political life, decided that an effective way of accomplishing that would be to establish an award given to an elected official who had, in the performance of his or her duties, exhibited a strong devotion to integrity, as the Senator had done. An official true to the spirit of the Wayne Morris Pledge of Integrity. I will exercise an independence of judgment on the evidence of each issue. I will weigh the views of my constituents and party, but cast my vote free of political pressure and unmoved by threats of loss of political support. <clears throat> As in making past awards, the board of directors of the corporation made this selection after asking over a hundred distinguished people, participants in political life, academicians, theologians, journalists who are observers of political life, for nominations and for supporting evidence for those nominations of elected officials who, in recent years, have demonstrated great integrity in politics. This time, the board selected you, Senator Paul Simon, to be the recipient of this Wayne Morris Award. Though the board, when it makes the selection, has much discussion and hence some uncertainty that it has selected the best nominee, it has great confidence in its choice of you. For not only were you nominated 
by one to whom we previously gave an award, the distinguished former representative Republican Senator Lowell Weicker, but also by four of the leading clerics of our nation, Reverend James Wall, and Reverend Alfred Kloster of Christian Century, the prominent Lutheran theologian, Dr. Martin Marty, and the Catholic leader, Father Theodore Heshburn. And Reverend Wall states the case well. After tracing your career from your expose of political corruption as editor of the Southern Illinois paper, and through the State House and Senate Lieutenant Governor's Office, the United States House, and finally to the United States Senate, he says, during Paul Simon's political career, he achieved national recognition for his political courage, for his sponsoring of bills to alleviate world hunger, and to raise the standards of political morality. He was named the best legislator seven times and was the recipient of the American Political Science Award as Outstanding Legislator. Senator Simon is in the tradition of the late Senator Moyne Morris. His personal honesty is an example to everyone, and his public morality as a politician <coughs> is as impeccable as his private life. 